Well, if you have your Bibles this evening, just for a few moments, I want you to turn to the book of Colossians chapter number one. Colossians chapter number one. Just a moment. I want to begin reading at the very beginning of this portion of scripture that we find in the New Testament of the word of God. We understand this. We serve an omnipotent God. That simply means he is all-powerful. We serve an omniscient God. He is all-knowing. There is nothing that my God doesn't know about this time and this particular day. Our God is mighty. Our God is holy. There's nothing that our God cannot do. As we begin to study the book of Colossians, we must be reminded that this morning as we was in the book of 2 Thessalonians, we asked the question, who is faithful? We know the answer if we're children of God if we've been washed in the blood many times I have not been faithful but can I say God is always faithful to the children of God so the apostle Paul is reminding them that the Lord was preparing to return that we are living in the last day and the last hour but even in the wicked day that we are living in in this moment and in this time we understand we know that God will always be faithful. We we don't understand what may happen tomorrow. We cannot comprehend what may take in place in our life, but we do know that God has always been faithful to the children of God. So we gave it the application. If God is faithful, you and I should remain faithful. Whatever it means, whatever it takes in this last day, in this last hour, we must stay faithful to our service in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we ask this question, who is faithful in your life? We know the answer. It is always God. It always has been God. But tonight in this particular study, as we expound these scriptures, I want to ask myself this question. I want to ask you in your life as a child of God personally because Christ is a personal Savior. We understand who is faithful. But in my life, who is first inside of my life? As a matter of fact, when you begin to study the book of Colossians, you will find that everything the Apostle Paul has written under the inspiration of the Spirit of God in this particular book, he wrote it to emphasize one subject, one reason, and one purpose. It was to emphasize the preeminence of God in the life of the children of God. I want to encourage you to read every verse in the book of Colossians, and you will find everything that he has written, everything that God allowed him to pin down. He did it with this thought in mind that God should not be some things in our life, but God should be everything in our life. God should not be partial in our life, but God should be preeminent in our life. Every day that we live, every minute that we are alive, he must be preeminent in the life of the child of God. So we know who is faithful, but I wonder who is first in my life. Watch the Bible. Notice the word of God. I must lay the foundation. Colossians chapter number one and verse number one, just the salutation, the introduction. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, I love this, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I I love the language of the Bible. I I love the way the Apostle Paul has written the Word of God. He always introduces himself. He always gives this salutation of who he is and why God called him in the ministry. It is a place of authority as he is writing this to the children of God. Now watch verse number three, just introduction, foundation. Paul said, I love this, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this, praying always for you. You know what that emphasizes? Paul said, every time I go to my particular prayer closet, every time I fall upon my face and I begin to talk to a holy God, he wrote it under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Paul said, I'm praying for you. I'm asking God for you on your stead, on your behalf. Notice the Bible, verse number four, why are you praying that fervently for this congregation, Paul, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven where have ye heard before the word of truth of the gospel which has come, this is an amazing thing, which has come unto you. You know what that means? Somebody 
brought them the message of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. So Paul said, now that you have the gospel, it's come unto you. It's the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, uh, which is coming to you in verse number six. As it, I love this. As it is not, not in part of the world, not in some of the world, not in America, but as it is in all the world, bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you. Why? Since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. You know what the apostle Paul just said about that congregation? Since they, the day they had heard the message of the gospel and they received their salvation, they were fruitful children of God. They immediately began to work for the Lord Jesus Christ. They immediately began to bear fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. I began to think about this. I thank God for my local church. I thank I thank God for the Pax Prince Baptist Church. I thank God for the Taze Valley Baptist Church. I thank God we have a place that we can be a part of and we can be out of. But I wonder the testimony in my church. Would I be considered one that is fruitful? I wonder the testimony of my salvation. Since the moment I've heard the gospel, Paul said they were fruitful. Children of God. Watch the word of God. This is an amazing passage. Verse number seven, as ye have also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the spirit. For this cause, what their pastor, their servant said, for this cause we also, since the day we heard it, Paul was lying in prison. Do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. And all wisdom Spiritual understanding. Why? That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. And in, I love this phrase. And increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering and joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which he hath made us meek to be partakers of the inheritance in the saints of light. Literally, it was Christ that qualified us for the inheritance as a child of God. What has he done? Verse 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. It was Christ that paid the price in full. It was Christ that did everything that needed to be done. Do you understand? If it was not for the gospel, if it was not for the willingness of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd either be in hell tonight or we'd be on our way to a devil's hell tonight. It's all because of God's amazing grace. It's nothing that I deserve. It's nothing I could do in myself. I'm glad when I could not come to him, that's when he came to me and somebody gave me the gospel. Somebody told me I didn't have to remain that way. Thank God the price has been paid in full. If Jesus did all of that, what should I do with Jesus? If Jesus was willing to come out of a perfect place and come to a sin-cursed world to be born out of a virgin womb, to be tempted at our points and slaves that I am tempted yet without sin, and then he went to the cross, he shed every drop of his blood. If Jesus did all of that, what place? Where is he in my life? I thank God. For my Rachel, I, I, I can't live without Rachel. I, I don't know what I would do without Rachel. I, I met her when I was a little child, and I, and I thought then she talked too much. I really did, and I, and, I, and I thank God now that she does. I mean, she'll talk to any stranger. God bless me. God help me with that. I, I thank God for Rachel. Now, she's the most beautiful woman I've ever met in my life, and it just amazes me that God would allow me to marry someone like that. I, I thank God for Adeline, how God has allowed her to be used in the ministry. And I, I thank God that I'm her father. I thank God for my father, my mother, for all of my friends, one of my dear friends seated right here tonight that I am honored to preach behind this pulpit. I thank God for all that he's done, but not my wife, not my daughter, not my parents. 
Not my friends. Not one of them could bleed and die for me. Not one of them left heaven for me. Not one of them was able to do that for me. But there's only one that I've ever met that left heaven and came down to this earth and shed every drop of his blood for sinful mankind. I'd do anything for my wife. I'd do anything for my daughter. If your pastor called me, I would do whatever it took to prepare and to do what I need to do for him. But I'm telling you, so many times in my life, I have failed the Lord so many times in my life. He wasn't in first place. He wasn't top in order. I wonder if God would do all of that. What have I done? If I would do anything for my wife, but yet she didn't die for me. She couldn't. If I would do anything for my friends, my family, but I wouldn't do anything for Christ. Something is out of order in my life. I know he's faithful, but is he first? Revival time. What position is God inside of your life? Watch the word of God. Notice the Bible as we expound these particular scriptures. Look at verse number 14. Can I say this? Just quick introduction and then the exposition. Number one, that in all things Christ might have the preeminence. Can I say in verse number 14, there is in an insurmountable redemption. Insurmountable redemption. Watch the Bible. Look what he done. In whom we have redemption already. In whom we have redemption already been done. In whom we have redemption through his blood even even the forgiveness of sins, it is an insurmountable redemption. What's that mean? There's nothing else that needs to be done. Jesus paid the price in full. Jesus did everything. There's an insurmountable redemption. God did everything that needed to be done to redeem my soul. Watch the Bible. Notice the word of God, the insurmountable redemption. But look at the impeccable rank. That literally means faultless. Highest standard, a priority. Who is he? He is the image, verse 15, of the invisible God. The firstborn, (laughs) I love that, of every creature. You know what that means? The firstborn, that means he's highest in rank. There's nobody that's like him. There's nobody that can qualify with him. There's nobody that can even stand next to him. It's an impeccable rank. He is higher than the highest. He is greater than the greatest. He is better than the best. There's not a king on this earth that compares to the king of kings. There's nobody that we bow to except the Lord Jesus Christ. He deserves the preeminence. He deserves bowing to him. He is above everyone else. There's an insurmountable redemption. There's impeccable rank, the firstborn. Can I say number three? Look at the intentional rationale in verse number 16. For by him, watch this, not some, but were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Watch this, all things, not some things, all things were created by him and for him. It's an intentional rationale. God didn't do this thing that you and I may live some prosperous life. God didn't put all of this here that we can live the way we want to and act the way we want to. Everything that has ever been created, it was created by him, but it was created for for him that God would receive the glory. It's not about worshiping the creation. It's about the creation pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ, giving glory to a holy God. He deserves all the praise and glory. There's an intentional rationale how he created. Can I say there's an inexhaustible resource? Watch verse 17. He is right now, right now. He is before not some but all things. And by him all things consist. (laughs) That is an inexhaustible resource. There is nobody else that can lay that claim. There is nobody else that can boast that they're able. There is nobody else that can say what the apostle Paul just said. I don't care how big they think they are. I don't care how mighty they think they are. I don't care how much money they think they might have. They don't even compare to my God. They don't even work with my God. They are nothing compared to him. Here's the message. Is he first? There's an irrefutable reason. Verse number 18. And he is the head of the body, 
the church. <laughs> Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? Why? That in him, not some, not some. Watch that word. That in him all things he might have the preeminence. Who is the beginning? Who is the firstborn? There's nobody like our Savior. He alone is the preeminent one in position. He alone is the only one that deserves all of the preeminence. Do you understand and do you realize it's an irrefutable reason that I should make him first in my life? It's an irrefutable reason that he should be above everybody inside of my life. Thank God for my family, but I wouldn't have a family if it wasn't for a holy God. Thank God for my friends, but I wouldn't have these friends if it wasn't for a holy God. Thank God for his blessings, but I wouldn't have no blessings if it wasn't for a holy God. I wonder tonight who is first in my life. You know why many young families don't come back on Sunday night to have family time? I want to remind those that are here, you made the right choice because you wouldn't have time to have a family, you wouldn't have a family if it wasn't for him. You know how many people have stopped serving God because they're so busy with their children and they're so busy with their grandchildren and I understand that. I love my family. I thank God for what he's done in my life but I gotta keep preaching for him. I gotta keep serving him. I wouldn't have nobody if it wasn't for him. My father wasn't nothing but a drunkard but he got saved by the grace of God. It's only because of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an irrefutable reason I should make him first. He's the only one that deserves the preeminence in my life. So here it is. Who is first in your life? What area? What part? Your intellect, your emotions. Who is first in your life? Can I say these three things in the message? And I'll be done this evening. Number one, there's a reason for his deity. Watch the Bible, verse number 19 in the exposition. Why, why, why does he get all of the preeminence? Because it pleased the Father <laughs> that in him should all fullness dwell. That literally refers to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible said? Here's why Christ should be preeminent in my life. Because God said it pleases me that he is me. That's why Jesus said when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That's why you must be honest and say uh, he's all God, not ceasing to be all man. Uh, he was all man, not ceasing to be all God. Uh, he can be preeminent because he is God in the flesh. He was robed in the flesh. He wasn't just a preacher. He wasn't just a good man. Uh, he wasn't just a miracle working religion a leader. He was God. He is God. He'll always be God. He pleased the Father. Here it is. Everything that consists of God, it consists in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every part of God, it was a part of the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you why he ought to be preeminent. He's God. There's none like him. There's none above him. There's no other that can compare to him. Whether it's in your life or whether he is not in your life, he is still God. He will always be God. He always has been God. That's why the Bible says I am that I am. He is God in the fullness, in the flesh. He'll always be God. Why should he be preeminent? Number one, the Bible tells us there's a reason for his deity. But number two, watch the Bible. Look at verse number 20. There's a reason for his death. The Bible said, and continuing conjunction, having made peace, how? Through the blood of his cross. Why? By him, for this reason, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, emphasis, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. You know what the Bible just said? He took the cross. He was willing to bleed and die for my sins and for your sins. You're right. To reconcile somebody like me. To reconcile somebody like you. 
There is a reason for his death. He knew only Jesus could bleed and die. There was a sacrifice before Calvary every year. They would take him in, but there had to be another sacrifice every other time and every other year. And for thousands of years, they would sacrifice again and again and again. Oh, but then all of a sudden, 2,000 years at Calvary, Jesus Christ came and he was the ultimate sacrifice. That's when God said, I'm satisfied. Nothing else has to be done, no other blood has to be shed. Why should he be first? Because of the reason of his death, the cross, to reconcile us. Only Christ could perform such an act. You say, but I'm going to live good enough, impossible. Even my righteousness are filthy rags compared to God. It had to be Christ to reconcile us to himself. So notice the word of God. Why should he be first? Why should he, must he be preeminent? The reason for his deity, the reason for his death. But number three, watch the word of God. Look at the reason for his deliverance. Verse 21, and you, child of God, that's us, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, how? By wicked works. Yet now, hath he reconciled. The reconciliation, one said, is the act whereby God, through the atonement of Christ, it brings men who are at odds with him back into a peaceful, proper relationship with himself. Only Jesus could do that. Only Christ could do that through the blood that he has already shed. So watch the Bible, verse 22, the reason for his deliverance. In the body of his flesh, how? Through death. To do what? To present you. Watch this. Holy. You know, the Bible just said, because of Calvary, when I will be presented unto God, because of the blood of his only begotten son, he will present me as holy. A man that deserves a devil's hell, a man that should be burning in hell at this moment and at this second, but because I've been reconciled through the blood of Jesus, because I've been washed in the blood, there is no other fountain. There is no other way. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ. And now we will be presented holy. But I love this word, and unblameable. One put it this way. When God sees me, he sees his son. He sees the blood. He's blinded by the son. He sees what Jesus did at Calvary. You know what that means? He don't blame me. He don't blame you. Somebody said it was my sins that were holding in there. It may have been, but God's not blaming you. God's not blaming me. He went there as a willing vessel to bleed and die for all of the sins of the world. Who's first? Who's first? Watch the Bible. Because of what he's done, the reason for the deliverance, not only will I be presented unblameable, holy, but unreprovable in his sight. When God sees me, here's mercy. He don't give me what I deserve. If I got what I deserve, I'd be burning in hell tonight. If I got what I deserve, I sure wouldn't be up here. It's nothing. There's no good that I can do in myself. He sees me as someone that is unreprovable. The punish has already been done. The payment has already been paid. Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Jesus did all of that. Jesus paid all the debt in full. Why is he not first in my life? Why is he in my life many times, but somewhere near the bottom? And I'll get back to him later when I'm done with my pleasure and my fun. If he did all of that, how can he not be first? in my life. Adley, I want you to help us with this invitation. I believe this is all that God wants. Here's what the Bible said. Paul said, in all things, you might have the preeminence. 
You know what that means? There's no other place in my life Christ should be except preeminent in every area. How many parents were faithful to God, loved Jesus, faithful to the house of God, but then their children came along and the very blessings that God gave them they became first. God got stuck somewhere down the list. I've known many young men to pray for a wonderful godly wife and God gave them one. God gave them one. There's no doubt in my mind, none. This is the wife God had for me. No doubt in my mind. The day, this, this is my father, he's more godly than I am. The day I was married, after we said our vows, my father came down to the basement of the church. So I was changing clothes, getting out of that crazy tuxedo. Whoever started that tradition ought to be shot. But anyhow, put on jeans and boots. It was changing. My dad came down. He said, God, answer my prayer. What are you talking about, Dad? You've been reading your Bible too much again. <laughs> no, no, son. When he was four or five years old, I said, God, let him marry that girl. No doubt in my mind. I'm just glad she's pretty. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> Who would I be knowing, 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 knowing God gave me her? How could I ever put her before Christ? I don't know how God has blessed you. God only gave us one little baby. It took us five years to have her. Finally, we graduated from college. And Rachel said, I think, I think I'm expecting her. We were so excited. God only gave us one. I don't know why. But I know the only reason we have her because we began to pray. God answered that prayer. Who would I be to ever put her before Christ? I wouldn't have her. By the way, I don't know your story, but you wouldn't have a baby either if it wasn't for Jesus. How many parents allow the talent of your young people to get them unfaithful to Christ? That'd scare me to death. I've got friends. I, I love your pastor. I do. I, I love your pastor. He's, I, I don't know why. He's, show, he's been so good to me. I, the first revival, Brother Smith, I ever preached for you was 20 years ago this year. Yes. When I got my love offering, I bought a leather jacket. Praise God. It's in my closet. He's been so good to me. Your pastor. And God keeps us so busy. I, 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 God's, God's blessed me. I've got friends, but I don't have time to spend any time with my friends. I'd love to just spend a few days with you. I don't think I can do that. Because this is a friend that motivated me, told me to be a preacher. Keep preaching the word. If God opens the door, yes. go through it. Yes. I could call a few churches and say, I'm not coming. I, I want to spend some time with my friends. I can't do that, preacher. I wouldn't have friends like I have here. If it wasn't for him. So here's the message. Who's first in my life? Who's first? Here's the invitation. Who's first in your life? 
preeminent in every aspect of your life. Children, grandchildren, materials, blessings. Here it is. Jobs, careers. Can I say, if God has given you a wonderful career, that's exactly who gave it to you. God. So who's first? Who's first? I don't, I don't know how God is speaking to you, but it, it, it's not Jubilee. It's revival time. So just a moment, I'm going to pray. I, I know some of you are uncomfortable still coming around this altar, and I understand. I understand. I, I, don't, I, never, I didn't like crowds before the pandemic, but anyway, I understand. In just a moment, somewhere in this building, let's just give ourselves back to God this week. Let's do what I need to do and say, God, I'm sorry. God, there's been many times you really haven't been first. If you'd have been first, I'd have read my Bible more. If you'd have been first, I'd have prayed a little more. If you'd have been first, I'd have told more souls about you. Here's the invitation. Who is first? Oh, I know who's faithful. <laughs> the preeminent one. But who is first? Would you stand with every head bowed, and every eye closed? Father, we need you tonight. God, I need you. God, I need you bad. God, I failed you in my life in this aspect. God, I thank you for the Bible. Help us to obey it. Help us to listen as mothers, as fathers, as grandparents, as Christians. Thank you for your blessings. But Lord, help us to never put the blessings before you. Help us now to put you first. Dadly, would you sing? Every child of God, let's just come. Maybe, maybe you don't want to come to the altar. But maybe gather around these seats somewhere. Let's just bring your family. Tell God you're going to put your family. You'll never put your family before him. You're going to put him first in your family. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Shout of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus, Jesus paid, paid every bit of it. Paid every bit of it. Here's what I owe him. I owe him everything. I owe him everything. Brother Don Sisk, great missionary. He's been to this place, been on this platform. As in Bible college, I'll never forget one of the first illustrations Brother Don Sisk ever used. He said, when I went to the mission field, I told my earthly father goodbye, and I never had the opportunity to see him again. I don't want that to be true. Do you understand how much God is going to bless that sacrifice? He was telling God, you're first. You're preeminent. Who is first in your life? Adley, sing another verse. Preacher, you come when you're ready.